Hey, everybody. I uh, hope you're doing well. Things are looking and maybe sounding a little bit differently. Sorry about that today. Uh, getting used to a new computer and getting everything set up. So I'm kind of going old school with the computer's camera and microphone as opposed to my fancy one. So anyway, uh, it's time to get started on the Lord's Supper. Uh, so you should have at uh, Ash Wednesday service picked up the packet for this last unit of this confirmation year. And uh, we'll get started. We'll probably go a couple pages into it, maybe three, um, and then we'll break it up that way. So, but before, of course, we got to get to some jokes. Uh, this one's called the Talking Centipede. A single guy decided life would be more fun if he had a pet. So he went to the pet store and told the owner he wanted to buy an unusual pet. After some discussion, he finally bought a talking centipede, 100 legs. It came in a little white box to use for its house. He took the box home, found a good spot for the box, and decided he would start off by taking his new pet to church with him. So he asked the centipede in the box, Would you like to go to church with me today? We will have a good time. But there was no answer from his new pet. This bothered him a little, but he waited for a few minutes and then asked, How about going to church with me and receive God's blessings? But again, there was no answer from his new friend, the pet. So he waited a few more minutes, thinking about the situation. The guy decided to invite the centipede one last time. This time, he put his face up against the centipede's house and shouted, Hey in there, would you like to go to church with me and learn about God? Okay, here we go. This time, a little voice came out of the box. I heard you the first time. I'm putting on my shoes. Okay. Some Christian, Christianized football terms. A quarterback sneak is when church members quietly leave during the last hymn. I've seen some of you do that. A draw play is what many children do with the bulletin during worship. Or I've seen some of you students do this on your sermon notes also. I like the art, by the way. Halftime is the period between Sunday school and worship when many choose to leave, unfortunately. Beach warmer. Those who do not sing, pray, work, or apparently do anything but sit at church. Backfield in motion. Making a trip to the back, restroom, or water fountain during the service. I see this happen, too. I understand. Staying in the pocket, what happens to a lot of money that should be given to the Lord's work? Two-minute warning. That point at which you realize the service is almost over and begin to gather up your children and belongings. There you go. Instant replay. The pastor loses his notes and falls back on last week's illustrations. I don't think I've ever done that. I'm a little OCD about those things. Sudden death. What happens to the attention span of the congregation if the preacher goes overtime? <clears throat> I see that look on people's faces too. A trap is when you're called on to pray and you're asleep. Does this ever happen in class? Hmm. End run. Getting out of church quick without speaking to any guest or fellow member. <clears throat> I've seen people do this with my line. Of course, sometimes my line can get a little long. Um, flex defense, the ability to allow absolutely nothing said during the sermon to affect your life. The halfback option is the decision of 50% of the congregation not to stay for Sunday school or Bible study. It's probably higher than 50%, actually. And a blitz is the rush for the restaurants following the closing prayer. And one last one here. Bob Hill and his new wife, Betty, were vacationing in Europe. As it happens, they were doing this, they were, they were vacationing near Transylvania. They were driving in a rental car along a rather deserted highway. It was late and raining very hard. 
Bob could barely see the road in front of the car. Suddenly, the car skids out of control. Bob attempts to control the car, but to no avail. The car swerves and smashes into a tree. Moments later, Bob shakes his head clear to clear the fog. Dazed, he looks over at the passenger seat and sees his wife unconscious, with her head bleeding. Despite the rain and unfamiliar countryside, Bob knows he has to get her medical assistance. Bob carefully picks up his wife and begins trudging down the road. After a short while, he sees a light. He heads towards the light, which is coming from a large old house. He approaches the door and knocks. A minute passes. A small, hunched man opens the door. Bob immediately blurts, Hello, my name is Bob Hill, and this is my wife, Betty. We've been a terrible accident, and my wife has been seriously hurt. Can I please use your phone? I'm sorry, replied the hunchback. We don't have a phone. My master is a doctor. Come in, and I will get him. Bob brings in his wife. An older man comes down the stairs. I'm afraid my assistant has misled you. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a scientist. However, it is many miles to the nearest clinic, and I have the basic medical training. I will see what I can do. Igor, bring, me the labo bring them down to the laboratory. With that, Igor picks up Betty and carries her downstairs, with Bob following closely. Igor places Betty on a table in the lab. Bob collapses from exhaustion and his own injury, so Igor places Bob on an adjoining table. After a brief examination, Igor's master looks worried. Things are serious, Igor. Prepare a transfusion. Igor and his master work feverishly, but to no avail. Bob and Betty Hill are no more. The Hill's deaths upset Igor's master greatly. Warily, he climbs the step to his conservatory, which houses his grand piano. For it is here that he has always found solace. He begins to play, and a stirring, almost haunting melody fills the house. Meanwhile, Igor is still in the lab tidying up. His eyes catch movement and he notices the fingers on Betty's hand twitch, keeping, them to the haunt, keeping time to the haunting piano melody. Stunned, he watches Bob's arm begin to rise, making the beat, marking the beat. He's further amazed as Bob and Betty both sit up straight. Unable to contain himself, he dashes up the stairs to the conservatory. He bursts and shouts to his master, 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 the hills are alive with the sound of music. Continue on. We are starting the Sacrament of Holy Communion. Let's jump in. So, I want you to think about what do these holidays have in common? And talk about it as a family. Is there anything that you probably do at some point on each of these days? And you do it with those that you gather with. Can you think of anything? It's eating, isn't it? Now, maybe you found up some others. You'll have to let me know. But generally, when we get together to celebrate things, right, we have a meal. We sit down together with our friends and our family, and we have a meal. Why is that? Why is it that celebrations are so common? Why are meals so common to celebrations? Maybe you can talk again, talk about that a little bit as a family. But it has something to do with, of course, the Lord's Supper. Part of it is, of course, we need to eat, right? That's how we stay alive. We need the food. We need the energy. Um, and because of that, right, um, eating in itself is a celebration. Uh, we live in a day where we've got more food than we know what to do with. Um, but if you go back not too long ago, right, there were 
people were celebrating just that they had food at all. So to be able to sit down and, and have a meal was a celebration. But there's another reason here. When we sit down together with other people, right? Think about lunch at school, right? We build relationships. Um, that's why you sit by certain people at, at lunch, right? And not others. Um, that's a whole nother concept. But yeah, I mean, we sit down with those that we are friends with and we care for. And we build relationships while we eat. This is why it's so important, why they, they say that it's crucial that families actually sit down together at a table, not in front of a TV, but at a table on a regular basis. Oops, I delete that. Sorry about that. Um, that they sit down together and have a meal together because it's important for relationships. It's important for our mental well-being as well. All right. So that's a, a part of what we're going to be looking at here um, at communion as well. So what is a sacrament? We've talked about this, but uh, it's important to review it again. Uh, you just answered this on a, a test recently. A sacrament is a sacred, do you see the connection? Sacrament, sacred act, which means that it's set apart. It's something special, devoted. Um, we define a sacrament for our church body as one. It's a sacred act that is instituted or established, started, founded by God. In which God himself has joined his word, right? That living, active word that does something to us. So it's a word of promise here, which we would call the gospel, right? He connects that joins it to a visible element. In baptism, we talked about that visible element is the water. And in Holy Communion, what is it? It's bread and it's wine. We continue on with the definition. And so he, he commands it. He starts it. <clears throat> um, he connects his word, that living active word, to a visible element. And by doing so, he offers, he gives, and he seals, right? He, he puts it together permanently. What? The forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins that Jesus earned on the cross and through the empty grave. We would also define a sacrament as the visible form of an invisible grace. All right, can God forgive without a physical element? He doesn't need it, but he does it in part for our own well-being because we're visible, we're physical, right? Okay. There are other names, depending on the church body that you go to, but lots of other names that we call Holy Communion. Of course, the Lord's Supper is one that we use a lot. It's also the sacrament, right, of the altar. We understand what sacrament is now. Eucharist, which is something you might hear in a Catholic church. The, the term Eucharist means to give thanks. Sometimes you also hear it as the Lord's table, although not a lot. And then also the breaking of bread. So there are some other terms by which uh, people, you might hear people talk about Holy Communion. So again, who instituted or started Holy Communion? Jesus Christ did, right? We know this. When did he do this? Well, this event we're going to be uh, celebrating towards the end of um, Lent. It's also the night in which you eighth graders, God willing, uh, if you've proven that you've understand this, that you'll be able to receive communion for the first time. He instituted on the night he was betrayed. We call it Maundy Thursday, Holy Thursday. We remember the events of that night. Um, so again, we call it Maundy not Mon, not Monday, uh, but Mondi. Uh, and this term, you know, it's, it's I've tried as a for our church to get away from calling it Mondi Thursday and just call it Holy Thursday, because we're not really quite for sure a hundred percent what the term means. We've got two good guesses. 
One is it comes from a Latin term, mandatum novum, novumdo, which means a new commandment. So he says that night, a new command I give you. Love each other as I have loved you. So we would say Mondi or a new commandment. Uh, there's also in history, there was a uh, an old custom, a practice, kind of like uh, Christmas today, of carrying gifts to the poor in, in what they called mons or hand baskets on that day. So <clears throat> either could be right. The problem is, is neither of them really has much to do with the Lord's Supper. So I kind of like Holy Thursday. Um, so there are four different places in scripture where we receive from God the words of institution. The first of them is from Matthew chapter 26, where Matthew writes, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take eat. This is my body. So the bread is contains or represents, it contains, right? It is the body of Christ. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant. And we'll, we'll unpack this, right? Uh, uh, the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus is telling us what's happening here in that account. In Mark chapter 14, Mark writes, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, sorry, it's a typo on my part, this is my body. Those words never change. The words around the quotes of what Jesus said may change a little bit. Um, then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my body the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Uh, from Luke chapter 22, we read, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Still, he says, This is my body, right? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And finally, this comes from Paul to the first letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. There we read the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, betrayed, right? Took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. I'm sorry, I'm so used to saying this. Uh, when he betrayed, get, uh, given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> so, and then the question is, and we're at question six here, is what does Christ give us in the Lord's Supper? He gives us his own true body and true blood for the forgiveness of sins. What do we see? What do we taste? Um, bread and wine. So does everyone then, in, in this this is where we begin to talk about faith. How faith is an important part of this and how we don't just let, because God commands us and we love others, we don't just let anybody come up and receive this. And we'll talk about this down the road is because you can receive this actually in a way that hurts you rather than helps you. So, and this is because um, everyone who receives the bod, bread and wine um, they also receive um, that's a bad question here. What I meant to ask here is does everyone who receives the bread and wine also receive the body and blood of Christ?
price? And the question is, and the answer is yes, it is. Sorry about that. So yeah, so whether you you come up to receive the Lord's Supper, if you whether or not you believe in Jesus or believe it's the body and blood, that doesn't change the fact that it is his body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine. So I need to fix that question a little bit. Sorry about that confusion. But again, the, the point is that whether you believe or not doesn't change what is present at the Lord's Supper. And so if you don't believe, it can actually hurt you. Um, but if you do believe, right, it's an incredible gift that we give. Okay, question nine. Sorry about that. Jesus doesn't say how often we need to receive the Lord's Supper, but just that we should. <clears throat> in, in times of the apostles, it was celebrated every Sunday. Um, why do you think we should receive it often? Pretty good question, I think, right? Why don't we just do it once and be done with it, right? Kind of like baptism. Well, Christ commands us, but more importantly than telling us to do it, he invites us, right? He invites us to this table. We, we, we get excited when we get invited to special meals. And that's what the Lord's Supper is. He invites us to it. Um, his words, uh, the promise and offer uh, that he has for us is, is great blessings for us. Um, so why would we not want to receive that, right? Is there too much God's blessing for us? I don't think so. And then finally, why right, we need forgiveness of our sins. It's not like uh, we haven't sinned in the last week or day or even minute, right? We need that forgiveness. And our faith falters, and we need that faith strengthened. And so God does that in the Lord's Supper. He strengthens us for to live a new life, a better life in and with Christ. Okay. Um, I think we will stop there for now. Um, this goes seven pages, so that gets us too uh, into it, um, and we'll uh, we'll continue from there. Actually, let's do a couple more pages. Let's do one more page. One more page. Okay, here we go. Page three. So, benefits. <clears throat> What's actually going on here? What are we receiving? Why is this so good for us? Okay. Um, Luther says, and you've memorized, these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins show us that in the sacrament, forgiveness of sins, life and salvation are given us through these words. But where there is forgiveness of sins, right, there is life and salvation. So that's what, those are the benefits. Forgiveness of sins. Uh, Paul right or Peter, right? writes in his first letter, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, bought back uh, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That's a big part of my sermon for tonight, which is Ash Wednesday, which is why you'll see I have ashes on my forehead from uh, the high school's uh, chapel this morning. Um, we also receive life and salvation, as Luther tells us. John six fifty one says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Wow. That's pretty impressive. This bread is my flesh. Right? It's pretty clear what we're receiving here. Um, which I will give for the life of the world. Uh, strength for new life. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is life because of righteousness. So does everyone, again, who eats and drinks the Lord's Supper also receive forgiveness, life, and salvation only through faith in Jesus? Can we receive forgiveness, life, and salvation? Without faith, we would receive these things to our condemnation. So then who can receive this? Luther writes, fasting and bodily preparation are certainly 
fine outward training. Those are good things to do. I know of some people who will fast on Sunday mornings, not have anything to eat, maybe some water, um, and nothing else until after they receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, Luther continues, but that person is truly worthy and well-prepared who has faith in these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. But anyone who does not believe these words or doubts them is unworthy and unprepared for the words for you require all hearts to believe. So, what should you do? Well, you should examine yourself. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, let a person, again, examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. Take some time to reflect and think about how much you need this forgiveness, life, and salvation. How far you've fallen. Um, there's some questions and answers. Uh, you can find these in your uh, small catechism that are helpful. Um, I don't think many of you would know. We had a couple now that's both deceased here who used to go through these questions as a couple every Saturday evening before receiving the Lord's Supper. Um, ultimately, <clears throat> are you sorry? And then also you need to answer these questions. Are you really sorry for your sins? Do you believe in Jesus as your Savior and in his words? Do you plan, with the help of God, of the Holy Spirit, to change your sinful life? 1 Corinthians, again, eleven twenty seven 27 says, whoever, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, see, here's the part that we have to pay attention to, will be guilty of profaning, right? Mocking, um, uh, disrespecting the body and blood of the Lord. That's not something we want to do. Which is a person, when is a person unworthy and unprepared? When they do not believe or trust God's words. Or also when they're living an unrepentant life, right? One that's openly sinful and they have no plans to change it. They don't think what they're doing is wrong or they have no desire to stop doing it. So um, those are times. And, and I'll tell you that <clears throat> obviously unbelievers, I don't know why they would want to receive it to begin with anyway. And we'll talk about Again, we'll talk about this more later on. Um, but I have known people um, who have, for a time, stopped receiving the Lord's Supper and then started receiving it again. I've known of people who've come in on um, a Sunday morning and for different reasons says, no, I can't do it today, um, but will the next time. So um, I, I think this is a sign of people who are very aware of where they are at. Uh, on a given day spiritually. And I, I think that's a good thing. Obviously, ultimately, we want to receive it as much as possible. Okay, so may those who are weak in faith come to the Lord's table. Absolutely, right? If we had the perfect faith, if we were the perfect people, we wouldn't need the Lord's Supper to begin with. Um, it's the lack of faith that um, is a struggle. That's that's bad for us. Um I think I've gone a little bit past that. Um, I think this will be a good place to stop right here. We'll get into uh, different definitions and beliefs in the Lord's Supper and how we're right and they're wrong uh, next time. So I think that's it for now. I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day, and we will see you in church.